Well, here we are on another Monday morning. Uh, I want to give you a little rundown on some air conditioning stuff. The weather's getting kind of hot. Although, really, this is July, and in this part of the deep south, the uh, weather has not been quite so hot uh, these days. Uh, it's like 84 degrees today, and it's, uh, you know, for uh, week in July. So, or actually, it's the beginning of the second week in July. But the point is, it's not as hot as they told us it was going to be. Uh, some of that has to do with the fact that there's no sunspots up there right now. Uh, but one way or another, let's jump into this AC stuff and uh, let's see if I can give you a little something you can chew on today. All right, climate control systems. You know, just about everybody that's got any um, knowledge or understanding about cars gets that. Uh, climate control system has a compressor, condenser, and evaporator. This here is a little expansion valve graphic, and there's a blower. You know, pulling air through the uh, condenser and another blower that gives you your uh, air into the register. But the, the older systems used to take a lot more refrigerant than the ones do now, even the old R12 ones. And uh, changing the R12 system over to an R30, R134 wasn't quite as complicated as they acted like it was. I'm not going to talk about R1234 in this particular presentation. Uh, just basically going to be covering most of what you'll be seeing out there anyway. Um, but cabin air filters have been around for about since about 1995. Every vehicle doesn't have one. Some do, some have them, some don't. Uh, my pickup doesn't have one. My Explorer doesn't have one. My wife's pickup doesn't have one. Uh, but uh, Taurus has started having them in 1996, and they filter down to 25 microns. Uh, interesting thing is on your Lexus vehicle, some of your Lexuses use horseradish to kill bacteria in their cabin air filters. Some of your Lexus platforms use ultraviolet light to uh, kill bacteria that's trapped in the uh, cabin air filter. But if you have a GM car or a van or whatever that doesn't have enough blower uh, flow, uh, the first place I like to go is the cabin air filter. Cabin air filter on some of these uh, Nissans is right in the middle. Uh, of the dash up under there and um, the one that you pull out of there there's a little hole about five or six inches and the cabin air filter accordions together and you pop it out of there well when you get a replacement cabin air filter from the park store it'll have two small ones to go in there you stick one in and it falls and then you stick the other in and it drops so that's kind of an odd thing right there uh, but you can typically look it up some of them will come with a place for a cabin air filter, but they won't have a cabin air filter there. And you'll need to make some minor modifications to break a little tab and pull a cover off of there, and put a cabin air filter in there, put a screw back in it. One way or another, cabin air filters are a pretty good deal because they keep the, uh, the dust out of your face and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and also, the, you know, there's a lot of dust out there on the road. Um, incidentally, if you don't know the difference between Max and Recirc, uh, max air is circulating the air inside the car. If, you got a, if you're behind a rendering truck, it's holding a dead cow or something, you'll want to turn it on max so you won't smell what's going on outside. Or if you're behind one of those vehicles that's got no carburetor on, it's not set up right, and it's burning your eyes with the exhaust, you put it on max and it closes the outside air off. And it's so that you're just recirculating the air that you got inside the car. Now, more and more of the air handling doors in your dash panel are driven by electronic servos instead of vacuum motors or cables. S-Class Mercedes has 10 of these babies. GM has been using them extensively on pickup trucks since about 1999. And they do fail and they do need to be replaced. Um, and the control heads on some of these GM vehicles need to be replaced. And that's not really a plug and play per se when you put it on there. You basically have to give it time to sweep the motors back and forth and find out where the end stops are before you do anything else. That's another story. Uh, this one here is, uh, as I remember, that's from a Mercedes and it's got all of these actuators. Now these actuators have got a CAN bus connected to them. And the, uh, they use these stepper motors. And what a stepper motor does is it walks signals to these coils to move this thing a little bit at the time. Um, some of your idle air control motors on your cars, uh, like your uh, General Motors cars, that little idle air control motors, got the cone shaped end on it, and on Jeeps and stuff, and on some of your Chryslers, they have stepper motors uh, that are there that basically walk that little armature around, and it's got a screw in the middle of it that moves the thing out and back in, and it's basically measured in steps on your scan tool. 
well in this particular case, uh, they use that for this on the uh, S-Class Mercedes. And it'll have like uh, 10 different uh, motors on it. Cool thing about those is, uh, they have, all of them are the, of identical design. The task of the actuator motor and the assignment of the flap to be actuated takes place whenever you got the wire harness plug, it's got some little jumpers in it. And when it jumpers certain pins in there when you're plugging it in, that it automatically programs the actuator you're putting in there for what that actuator is supposed to do. Uh, now on your Volkswagens, when you're replacing control head, uh, some of the Volkswagens for years would have the same exact control head to go on every one of their vehicles, but when you put it in there, you needed to be able to plug a scan tool in that was compatible and tell it what you were putting, you know, tell that control head what you were putting it in, if it was a, a Vanagon or if it was whatever it was, Passat, and it would know then when you told it what you were putting it in, what it was supposed to do with various different outputs, which was a pretty interesting way of doing that. All right. Uh, a number of even the most expen inexpensive no-frills vehicles have been equipped with electronic blend door actuators for about, you know, 12, well, actually longer than that. The uh, Ford Ranger started having an electronic stepper motor type blend door actuator uh, back in the late 90s. And the reason for that was, if you're going to dial your little knob to cold and warm, you basically have a lot more resolution in those settings if you've got a motor that can just move that door a little bit. Back in the day, they would have little vacuum servos that would have a couple of different diaphragms in it, so it could move it part way. You had partial vacuum or whatever, and it could move. It would move it against spring pressure and all that. Well, uh, even the cheaper ones went away from that and went to electronic uh, blend door actuators, because the blend doors are the one to give you your cold and your warm air, and that's the one that if it fails the wrong way, and if it's letting warm air in there all the time, it'll keep your air conditioner from working right. So if you go out there under the hood and you're, uh, you got good frosty cold uh, suction line telling you that the uh, air conditioner is working okay as far as the refrigerant part of it, but you're still getting warm air, what you do is you block off the heater hose that's going into the heater core. Now the one coming out or you'll bust the heater core to block out the one going into the heater core and see if the air gets cold and that way you don't get a blend door issue. And that's fairly common to have blend door problems on just about any and all of these vehicles. Now, a lot of the times when these actuators fail, they'll break a little tooth off their plastic gears in there, and they'll be trying to move to the position where they want to be, got a little potentiometer inside where it's telling the, giving feedback to the control head where it's putting that thing. If it can't move it to where it wants to be, it'll go click, 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 and just about everybody's heard that. Uh, Chevy Impalas were horrible to have the one on the right side, uh, back there behind the glove box on the right side, go click, 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 and if it's one deeper in the dash that's clicking, sometimes there's a booger bear to get to those. But the point is, these actuators are the lifeblood of what makes the air flow where you want it to flow, whether it's warm or it's cold, whether it's max or recirc, and all that. Okay. Many manufacturers, as far as your compressors, are using clutchless compressors, where this is spinning all the time, but the way that it causes the compressor to either do more or less is it angles this plate. When you angle the plate, the pistons are moving. If the plate's straight up and down, it's spinning, but the pistons aren't compressing anything. And they basically use a little rotary valve in the rear of the compressor is electromagnetically controlled to feed refrigerant pressure into a special chamber that changes the angle of that plate. And they typically will not have a coil in here, but they will have some little breakaway things in there in case the compressor overpressures or gets locked up. It will basically bust those things, and then you'll have to replace that, you know, that front part. Anyway, there's still a bearing in there like there always was. But just be aware of that. You need to know what you're working on, basically. Here's the Sonata, like a 06 Sonata temperature actuator. The five wires are as follows. Position sensor reference, position sensor signal. Reference is going to be like your five volts, you know. And position sensor ground, that'd be like your signal return on a throttle position sensor. And this would be like your reference voltage, but that's your signal. And then motor control, it reverses polarity to go back and forth with the motor on that. And there's what it looks like underneath the dash. Now the intake actuator, which is the one for the recirc, it's on there uh, the same way. It's basically built the same way, and there's your different wire colors, and here's what, they're spoke, here's what they do. Uh, so that's a real interesting little deal there. The mode door actuator has to move more than one door. When you see one with all of this stuff hooked up to it, 
uh, and it's got one motor, it's having to do a lot of doors, it'll usually have a, a big funky thing on it with all them cams and channels and all that. When you're replacing that one, and Chevrolet trucks have got that on them too, one like that, you got to put that on there so those things are all in place, you got to be really careful with it. Uh, so make sure you understand that. And that's like, say, you see the same, you know, pattern developing here. And this is a schematic of it, you know, there's two of them that are driving the motor, and then here's the one with your sensor ground, although that's really sort of odd because to me the sensor ground is being fed in from the top and the reference voltage is being fed in from the bottom. That is wrong as far as I'm concerned. I don't like it when they run the ground in from the top, but that's just, you know, my personal preference. That's the layout for a door actuator on the Hyundai. Nothing new here. You know, a lot of them are laid out in a very similar fashion to this, so this is not just specific to the Hyundai. Chevy pickups are similar to this too. Now they're driven a different way. Uh, they're basically, they got electronics in there uh, inside the actuator that drive it based on the signal it gets. But that's another story. I already covered that on one video, I think. When checking the operation of it, a signal wire can be measured. That would be this one right here. For voltage changes while the control head not being manipulated. I like to get a, a meter and go right in here and then operate the controls for that actuator and see if that voltage is changing. It works pretty good to do that. All right. This wire layout is not a cooling fan. The cooling fan relay provides power and the electronic module uses it to drive the cooling fan at whatever speed the PCM deems appropriate. Works pretty good. The water temperature sensor is really an interesting thing in there. Helps the controller decide how fast the fan will run. The evaporator temperature sensor control helps prevent evaporator icing. That thing has been around for a long time on various different ones. Ford Fusions have those. Um, and a bunch of other ones too. A long time ago they used to have a little alcohol tube that went into the evaporator and it would basically drop the compressor out if the evaporator got too cold. If the evaporator gets too cold you got a block of ice there and no air will flow and so you've lost your AC. But notice how serviceable these two components are. Either one of them can be replaced in five minutes. That one there you just twist it and pull it out and that's what it looks like in your hand. Very, very easy to change. All right, the air quality sensor is mounted in front of the radiator out there and if it picks up on anything coming in that's going to make your eyes burn like I was talking about earlier, it automatically switches it to Mac. That's on the Hyundai. You don't usually see an AQS sensor on most vehicles. But you might notice the operating voltage is, you know, is well it's 9 to 16 because that's where your charging system operating temperature is minus 22 to 221. Gasoline engine exhaust, diesel engine exhaust, that's your detectable gas. That's the only things that'll smell. If you're behind a rendering truck and you're smelling a dead cow or a horse, this is not going to know about that. It only knows about diesel or exhaust. Uh, and that's where it's mounted right there. Uh, air quality sensor. All right. So, um, although I think that little diagram I showed you was the ambient air sensor, but the air quality sensor is right next to it. Hyundai's been kind enough to make two-digit codes just as reliable as the Beef Plus four-digit numbers we're used to seeing with our scan tool. Hang on to that chart, you know, on that one right there, you turn your ignition switch on, you press the off switch more than four times within two seconds while pressing the auto switch. So you hold this, press that four, all the graphics on the display will blink on, the diagnostics chart will give you your code, and you press your eight, you know, you can go through one step or another. What it that typically does on these look like this, you know, Cadillac was doing this back in the early 90s uh, and possibly before that. But anyway, what it'll do is it sweeps these uh, doors through their uh, travel and then it looks for where they're stopping. Uh, I used to see on Eagle Premiers would do that too. We, we had, uh, we, we would do those on that. All right, so Know the law, though, about refrigerant and AC. If you're not ESCO certified and you're caught working on a refrigerant part of the AC, it's a $33,000 fine. It can and it has happened. If the wrong person, like if you, and this can follow you for a long time, if the uh, EPA guy runs into a situation where they know there's a problem and they come to the shop and you're the one that did the work and you were not AS, ESCO certified, even if the shop owner is, even if the guy working in the next service bay is, if you're not ESCO certified, you're in big trouble. Now I've got ESCO certification, it's not hard to get. Go to ESCO Institute and get ESCO certified. Uh, that is how you shield yourself from that. Now if you're uh, working on your neighbor's air conditioning system in his yard, 
and he pays you anything, if he even gives you a pack of pork chops for working on his air conditioner, uh, you cannot touch that air conditioner for as far as the refrigerant part of it unless you're ESCO certified. That's really, really important. Never vent refrigerant to the atmosphere. It is illegal to vent refrigerant to the atmosphere. Don't ever, never do that. Never use a cheap no-name refrigerant because you never know what's going to be in it. It could be butane or just about anything else. Always wear safety glasses. Refrigerant under pressure can permanently blind you. Don't work on AC systems without proper training and understanding. This next part of the presentation is not for do-it-yourself people. I'm not trying to make everybody an expert on air conditioning. I'm just covering some stuff so we'll all be a little more knowledgeable about this stuff. Right? Now the subcooler is what they put on the Hyundai. That's another thing that's pretty interesting. Uh, the, you know, the condenser, everybody's familiar with the condenser, you know, as far as that. The condenser basically takes, uh, there's uh, low pressure, I mean high pressure gas from the discharge line coming from a compressor that comes in to the condenser. And then the condenser has a tendency to condense that into high pressure liquid. Well, what this does, not only does it condense it into high pressure liquid, it actually runs it into a second part where it cools that high pressure liquid. You might have noticed that the liquid line, when you put your hands on the liquid line, you wind up feeling it being really, really hot. Well, on this one, yeah, that, that liquid goes through there and it goes through the uh, orifice or the expansion valve and then it turns into a mist and evaporates in the evaporator and as it evaporates it absorbs heat and that's why you've got cold air. And then it goes back and it's squeezed, you know, it comes out of the suction line uh, back to the compressor and the suction line is going to be really, really cold and frosty usually. And I mean if it's working right. And uh, that suction line is supposed to be frosty all the way to the compressor. If it's not, you probably don't have enough refrigerant in there. Uh, but it's always good to know how much is supposed to be in there and have the right equipment to put it in instead of just guessing at it. Healthy pressures on a warm spring day if you've got gauges connected. This one here, you notice it's got about 38. This is pretty well correlates with temperature. Very close. You might notice the gauge has got three different scales on it for R134, R12, and R22. Now, you might notice that uh, that particular one I always look at these outside numbers just for the heck of it. But uh, this one right here is your, your poundage right here. This is temperature scale here. But that right there, we got about 38 uh, PSI on that side. And we got about, oh, about 275. Well, I'm sorry, 235. We're running at 275. So that, on a warm spring day, you're going to see that. Ambient temperature is going to have a lot to do with what these pressures are reading. If the thing is... If it's a day where it's really uh, hot, it's going to be higher. That's what this is. This is a healthy system on a hot day. See this one here, it's actually, actually pulling a little less than a different vehicle. Uh, but when you see this head pressure going higher, if this is still down low, then you're in a pretty good shape as far as that. Because you're going to see higher head pressure on a hot day. That's just part of the deal. Now, low static pressure. Uh, means you're low on refrigerant. This is without the air conditioner running. This is when you just hook your gauges up after you've identified the refrigerant and you look and you see what you can see. All right. Notice right here it's about 50 PSI on both sides. Now I will say this. There is no chart. There are no absolute specs for static pressure and what it should be. You can look at it and tell if it's low but you might look at static pressure that's 100 pounds on each side and still be low on refrigerant. So be aware of that. You cannot always tell by static pressure. Static pressure can look good and still have insufficient refrigerant. All right. Fully charged system, bad expansion valve. Notice it's pulling low. It's lower on both sides than it should be, even though it's fully charged. That's a bad expansion valve. One time on a Toyota, though, I saw... Uh, that one, we replaced the expansion valve and it didn't fix it, we had to put an evaporator on it. But most of the time it's the expansion valve, a clogged orifice can also do this. If you've got a high head pressure, pull the radiator back and have a look at the condenser. Also make sure your fan's working. If you've got one of those, I've got a video on my YouTube channel that you might be able to find where I had uh, the uh, air conditioner head pressure was going really, really, really high on this little black Nissan pickup truck. And I put a fan in front of it, and it cooled it right down. And I found out that the fan clutch was bad on that one, 
and it basically wasn't moving air across the condenser because it was a belt driven fan with one of those viscous clutches. And those viscous clutches provide <coughs> have more resistance whenever the uh, whenever the it's hot air is going through there. And so the fan is supposed to pick up more speed. If that clutch is locked up, it'll make a lot of noise. Anyway, what I wanted to say about this though, this right here, if you pull that radiator away from that condenser, you may see the stuff that you may look at the front of the radiator and say, I don't see anything there, this isn't a big deal, but that stuff will somehow go all the way through the radiator and stop on the condenser. So you may have to look down between the condenser and the uh, radiator to see if there's any of that stuff in there. You'll be surprised how often, and it can be clogged up with dirt and stuff too, and cause the air conditioner to have high head pressure and not work right. Uh, be mindful of fan problems. This fan here was smoking, and there's a, this was another one where the fan uh, was not working because the fuse had developed resistance right here and it burned out that fuse. Really, the, uh, this fuse panel should have been replaced. Uh, we scratched around on that terminal and put him a fuse in there because that's all he wanted to do. This is another little story I can tell you about this smoking fan. This wasn't a picture of the actual fan, but I knew this lady that had an 86 Oldsmobile. It had a little four-cylinder with uh, throttle body fuel injection on it. It had one little fuel injector in there. And she was driving that thing and she called me when I was leaving work one day and she says, my car has quit on me right about the time I crossed the traffic circle over here and it's sitting here and I started up and it goes dead and I don't know what to do about it. And I said, okay, let me see what I can do. So I went over there and you know now when you can take the air cleaner off and look at that little injector. And so when she started it up, as soon as she started it up, uh, the injector was doing a bunch of extra squirts to the point where it stalled the engine and even after the engine stalled it was still squirting fuel out of that injector. And about the time that all of that was happening I started smelling something and I looked and I saw smoke coming out of the fan like you see right here on this one right here. And so I unplugged the fan and I said start it again and when she started it again it ran perfect. I plugged the fan back in which was partially shorted and creating all kinds of electrical noise. The fan was running but it was partially shorted and there was electrical noise just washing through the engine compartment and confusing the engine controller. And I told her, I said, don't turn on your air conditioner and drive home without the air conditioner on. I actually unplugged the fan and left it unplugged, I think. But I said, if your air conditioner's on and this fan's trying to run, you're gonna have it. I put her a fan motor on there uh, later that day or whatever, or later that evening and took care of her problem so she didn't have any more issues with that. But that was a bad fan motor that was causing the fuel injection system to go crazy. So anytime you got a stinking smoking fan motor, you know, make sure the fan blades can spin freely too because sometimes if they get bound up on the housing, uh, the fan blower motor housing, I've actually seen that burn up fan motors before. Alright, so the old GM clamping diode uh, that's one I took a picture of on an older Chevrolet because it's right there. You can see it, the old clamping diode. Power can go this way, but it can't come back that way. This is the one bringing power to the clutch. And what happens whenever you release the clutch, you know, the magnetic field sweeping across those windings has a tendency to cause a voltage spike that will go screaming back. Uh, and that's what it looks like. This is an 08 Chevy, uh, as I remember. Uh, and you notice they put one they put a diode in there even on this one. This one they had it right there. On this one here they just got it in the in the box there, you know. So that's one of the things you see. One time I was working on a truck that was a uh, cable vision truck from a local town. Brand new truck. Kept frying radios. And it was a, just an AM radio. It was a plain old truck. And uh, they put a radio in it and fried that radio. Put another radio in it and fried that radio. So they gave it to me after the other people put radios in it. I mean it was just a the factory radio still under warranty. They had a power takeoff that was being driven by an AC style compressor clutch. Had a long shaft going back there to the hydraulic pump, belt driven. And uh, I got in there with my scope connected to the radio power fuse. And I got to turn this stuff off and on in the truck. And I, when I turned off, when I turned on that power takeoff and I turned it back off, I saw a 400 volt spike go screaming into the radio. Well, it just knocked the crap out of the radio. Some of your starter <clears throat> relays on your Fords had a uh, diode built into a little starter relay on a fender, you know, they had to have a diode built in there because the collapsing uh, magnetic field whenever that thing was released would 
send a spike go screaming back. That's what that diode's for. The way I fixed the cable vision truck was I added a diode, just like you'd have in one of these, and they never lost another radio. Uh, not a very difficult fix, but when you see that clamping diode, that's what it's for. It keeps an electric spike from going back and damaging other stuff. Pressure issues can be a result of a busted desiccant bag losing its innards. Right there, I've, that's one right there that we saw when we took this off. You can see all those little balls down in there. And that's why it's really important anytime you're doing some air conditioner work to replace the dryer or the uh, dependent. You know, if it's got an expansion valve, it'll have a dryer on it. And if it's got an orifice tube, it'll have a, a, uh, an accumulator. The accumulator will be on the low pressure side, right up there close to the evaporator. The dryer will be out be in a liquid line. But the point is, either one of those can dump refrigerant. But some of them are built so they won't, I mean, they won't dump desiccant balls so right so bad. But that big old bag that's in that uh, uh, accumulator can, can lose those desiccant balls and just fill the whole system up with stuff that will clog up everything. That's what we ran into right there. I don't remember which vehicle that was on, but I took that picture. All right, always check the orifice. You'd be surprised how many times people try to work on it and say about ever checking the orifice tube. The orifice tubes are color-coded. <coughs> they have them at the parts store in the same color code that you need. You need to tell them which one you want to get it for. They don't cost but a dollar and a half. Now, some of them were built into the liquid line. On your Jeep Car Cherokees and stuff, they're actually built into the liquid line. And I think they're built into the liquid line on some of the Tauruses, too. But the long and the short of it is that that is an extremely important component. It filters, but it also is the place where the liquid is turned into low-pressure liquid so it can evaporate. You know, basically, a mist is like putting your finger over the end of a water hose, and it evaporates in the evaporator hose. Watch out for pulleys that are out of alignment, like this balancer that has slid forward, lets the belt get out of alignment. Watch out for bearings that crap out. This one right here, that's a big enough pulley to where it can stop the engine from starting. Uh, like if you, you might even uh, try to start one and go clunk, 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 and you say, oh no, the motor's locked up. Well, if you uh, get somebody to turn it with a breaker bar, you may see the belt slipping on the AC clutch. And these things do fail. That one failed right there. You see all the little balls out of there? That was, it, it died like that and it kept the engine from starting. Not all charge ports are this easy to find. I worked on a a Jaguar one time, looking for the low side port like they drove me up the wall. It was underneath the car behind the driver's side front tire. And the high side port was fairly easy to find. Well, Honda and some of the other ones now, most of the manufacturers now are putting them really close to each other, easy to find, and all that. No vehicle refrigerant system can be charged properly, though, until it's had all the air pulled out of it. So don't just put refrigerant in there, because air won't compress, it will cause the pressure in that system to go up really, really, really high. Even if you got a recycler, getting all the refrigerant out of the system on a cool day might take two or more attempts. Start the engine, heat the engine compartment up really, really, really hot if it's a cold day outside, and you'll usually get all the refrigerant out on one pull. You know, the newest refrigerant machines are supposed to do it anyway, but they're going to work better if the engine compartment's warm. Get an identifier and use it. This one here, you know, this had 23% R134 and 76% R12. That's one we checked in the shop. Even if the guy in the next service base is ESCO certified, like I say, that doesn't mean it's okay for you to work on this stuff legally. You can get in some trouble. Don't attempt AC repairs unless you got the equipment and the training. Don't use no-name junk refrigerant. Somebody's got butane and protein. Don't work without eye and skin protection. Not ever. Take that seriously. Even if you're jumping off a car, you need to have something to protect your eyes. And that's the end of the video. I really appreciate you guys coming and watching these. Um, hope you got something out of this one. Uh, it takes a little bit of energy and time to put them together. Uh, but I, uh, like I say, I hope it gives you some uh, stuff you can use and some interesting you know, things you can share with your buddies. But if you're not, like I say, once again, if you're not trained to do air conditioner work and you feel like you're just going to save yourself some money, uh, and you go out there, you can get in a lot of trouble uh, just assuming that it's low on refrigerant. So you, you got to be able to gather enough data so you'll know what's wrong before you get out there and get started uh, trying to just squirt some refrigerant in it with a can you got from the parts house. Some of them got little gauges on them and stuff like that. <clears throat> but you really need to know what you're doing. And um, I had this one guy, this one student of mine who replaced his accumulator and just charged his air conditioner up without even evacuating it. That's not a good idea because it, it can cause the pressure to go up and the pop-off valve on the compressor to light off. Uh, anyway, that's about all I've got for you today. 
I appreciate you tuning in. And until next time, we'll see y'all later.